Hi guys, Drew with Princess Craft RV and today we are going to be walking through the accessories and the appliances on the Bushwhacker Plus 17 FD by Braxton Creek. So starting right up front here, we are going to go over the loading and unloading process. This camper will ride on a two inch ball. Uh, we will start with the coupler in the unlocked position as you see it here. Uh, we are going to go ahead and crank our jack handle up uh, just enough to have that ball clear that coupler. Uh, once we have centered ourselves underneath that coupler, we lower our jack until our coupler seats fully on the ball. From there, we're gonna take our slide latch here, moving that forward, paying special attention that we do engage both these teeth there fully in the frame. Uh, definitely a recommendation to go a step further, add it, whether it be a spring clip or a locking pin to go ahead and secure this connection further. Once we've done so, we can go ahead and take our tow chains and cross those underneath the coupler, uh, paying special attention that we have enough room to make our turns left to right, but not so much room that they may make contact with the pavement. We're then going to take our seven way plug and plug that into the corresponding receptacle on our bumper. Now this is going to give us full function to your tow vehicles, braking system, charging system, tail lights, marker lights, all that fun stuff. Uh, again, making sure that we have enough room to make our turns left to right, but not so much room that this may make contact with the pavement. Next up here, we have our emergency breakaway cable. Now it's gonna be best suited if you go ahead and use a third or a separate connection point on the receiver for your emergency breakaway. So whether that be a carabiner, quick link, whatever you have, uh, do make sure that we are connecting this separate of the tow chains. Uh, what this is, is your last line of defense. If any of these other tow components were to become compromised as the two vehicles go ahead and separate, this is going to act like a ripcord to the electric brake system, helping you avoid like a runaway camper scenario or something along those lines. Uh, moving up here, we do have a 20 pound propane cylinder. Now this will be full for you at time of delivery. Uh, when we do go to need to remove this to have it serviced or refilled we will loosen our wing nut here uh, that's going to uh, secure that tension band we're going to make sure our service valve is in the closed position we will go ahead and disconnect our propane pigtail lift that tank out for service and then directly behind that we have a group 24 interstate d-cycle battery uh, this will carry a little bit of maintenance for you so what that will entail is every 90 days we want to go ahead and inspect the water level to do so, we're going to lift these panels off. You'll find a clear marked water level. We do just wanna make sure that we are maintaining that water level with distilled water. So first thing we're going to come to is going to be your fresh water drain. Uh, when we are filling that potable water or in terms draining that potable water, uh, we have a standard valve here. Uh, with any valve, if the handle is across the flow, it's closed with the flow it's open. So anytime the unit's gonna be in storage for more than seven days, it's very important that we do drain all of the water from the system. Uh, you only do need to drain that fresh water holding tank if you've actively filled it up. Our fill is gonna be right here on the trailer, uh, the trailer wall. Uh, what you're gonna do is you're gonna take your fresh water drinking hose, you're gonna stick it right into the orifice, you're going to fill it up to you, till you are satisfied. Now this is going to be your boondocking or your off-grid option. Uh, what that means is you are going to have a 12 volt water pump that's going to pressurize that system, draw that water up from the tank to the fixtures to make it usable. Uh, moving on here, we have our six gallon capacity water heater. Uh, now, the manufacturer of the water heater has some very specific recommendations in how you maintain this, uh, not only from a sanitary standpoint, but from a safety standpoint as well. Uh, as previously mentioned, anytime the unit is going to be in storage for more than seven days, we do need to drain it completely of water, and we are going to be draining the water heater separately. So, uh, number one, what we need to do is we need to make sure that this is cooled down to a safe working temperature. We don't want to burn ourselves or anything like that. Uh, once we've done so, we need to depressurize the camper as a whole. So we want to cut the inflow of water. If we're using a city water connection, it's as easy as turning the water off at the valve. If we are using our 12 volt water pump and potable water system, we're gonna just go ahead and turn that water pump off. Now, once we've done so, we are going to go to any hot water, the hot side of any fixture within the unit, whether that's gonna be the outside shower, the inside shower, the kitchen sink, 
Uh, any will do. We just need to open the hot side of that line. Uh, what that is going to do is depressurize the holding tank of the hot water heater. Uh, once we've done so, we're going to come out here to the outside. We are going to take an inch and a sixteenth socket extension and ratchet. We will then go ahead and remove our drain plug here. Uh, as long as we have safely depressurized the unit and it is at a safe working temperature, the rest of your water or contents within the holding tank are going to drain from this location. Uh, now on the flip side of things, when we are returning the unit back to service, it's important that we do prime or pump six gallons of water into the water heater before we try and start heating it. So uh, it's going to be a similar process. We're first going to go ahead and replace our drain plug. Uh, might you need to use some uh, pipe dope or some Teflon tape to keep that connection watertight. Uh, once we've done so, we're again going to use our inch and a sixteenth socket and extension and go ahead and uh, replace that drain plug. Once we've done that, we are going to repressurize the unit as a whole. So if we are again drawing off that city water connection, we need to turn that water on at the valve. If we are using our potable water here, we are just going to put that water pump or turn that water pump on. Once we've done so, we are again going to go to the hot side of any fixture. We're gonna turn that on. What we're gonna see is a little different scenario at this time. We're gonna see a lot more water coming from that fixture, but we're also going to see a lot more air. So what's happening is the, uh, the air within the tank is being displaced and refilled with water. Generally, it takes about five minutes for that uh, scenario to take place. Once that flow normalizes at the fixture, that is our indicator that we do have six gallons of water within the tank and we can go ahead and start uh, heating that water. Uh, also, one thing to mention, not only with our water heater here, but all of our propane appliances throughout the camper, it's very important that we do go ahead and utilize a bug screen to cover any exhaust vents. The reason being is that mud daubers in particular are attracted to the smell of propane and they would like nothing more than to uh, go ahead and make these exhaust vents their new home. Right next to the water heater, we will find a solar port. Now this is gonna be designed for a portable solar panel. So what that means is uh, we have a direct connection to the battery here, an easy plug and play connection. We can go ahead and plug our solar panel in, drag that out into the sunlight, directionalize it as needed, uh, and take advantage of that solar energy without having to do any modifications to the camper. Uh, moving on here, we have our furnace vent. Uh, now this unit utilizes a Dometic furnace, which is going to use propane as the source with 12 volt blower motor and uh, direct spark ignition. Uh, biggest thing with this is we wanna make sure we're not restricting the flow. It does blow very hot air when it is on. So uh, make sure that it is free and clear. And also it is a huge intrusion point for mud divers and flying insects. So we do wanna go ahead and further invest in those bug screens. And then right next to that, we have our 30 amp, 110 volt power supply. Now this is your cord, comes with the unit. It is 30 feet in length. It is only going to plug into the camper one way. So if we go ahead and unscrew this secondary collar here, and we go ahead and take a look at the shapes here. We have two slanted receptacles and one L-shaped. We have those corresponding shapes there on the trailer. If I plug straight in, we're gonna be right on the money. And this does utilize a twist lock connection. So from here, I rotate it an eighth inch to the right that locks it in. Then I can go ahead and screw down that secondary collar to screw that secure, or to, to secure that connection even further. For every unit that I deliver, I further recommend the addition of a 30 amp surge protector. So even with the most basic units, there's a ton of stuff going on throughout the unit electronically. And the only way to actively manage the power coming into the unit is going to be with a surge protector. So there's a couple styles available, different styles available on the market. Uh, one that is going to mount on the trailer side, kind of a hard mount option. It's always there kind of running in the background. Uh, the second option is going to be one that's going to plug in line with your power supply. Uh, whichever option you feel is best for you, of course, go for that. Uh, you know, out there in the wild, you're going to find substandard wiring, environmental surges, uh, use and abuse power supplies, things like that. And again, it's really the only way to effectively manage the power supply coming in. Now, if you do have any questions on further what we recommend or the products, of we, the products we recommend or how to use them, feel free to give our parts department a call. They would be more than happy to go ahead and further educate you on the proper use of a surge protector. And then moving on, we have our tire pressure and lug nuts. Now these are very important things with any camper. 
Uh, this unit is going to utilize a max 50 PSI tire pressure and with, with any trailer tire, you do wanna run them at the max. So that 50 PSI is going to give us the highest flexibility in terms of weight rating. Whether we are completely full or completely empty, that 50 PSI is gonna be a good number. Now also these lug nuts have been torqued in a star pattern to 100 foot pounds here in the shop. Every manufacturer does recommend a retorque procedure and that generally falls within the first 15, 25, 50, and 100 miles of initial travel. The manufacturer does want you to go ahead and stop, check and make sure these lug nuts are maintaining that 100 foot pounds of torque. Next up is going to be our city water connection. So this is what we're going to use when we are in the capacity of an RV park. Now when talking about our city water connection, water pressure becomes very important. Generally, you're going to find that these units are rated for a working water pressure in between 50 and 75 PSI. Uh, it's very important that we do regulate that incoming water pressure because out there in an RV park, you may find a water pressure upwards to 100 PSI. So uh, I generally will recommend people put their water pressure regulator as close to the water source as they can. So hook this directly onto the spigot. And then we're gonna go ahead and take our fresh water drinking hose, hook that directly onto the water pressure regulator ultimately making our connection here at the camper by rotating our trailer bound connection. Here we have our outside shower. Uh, from a functionality standpoint, not too terribly complicated. You do have access to hot and cold water. Uh, you do have a on off cutoff on the shower head that's gonna allow you to conserve water consumption if we do go ahead and choose to use this. Now this is all a complete self-contained unit. So when we're packing up, we do just go ahead and wrap our hose here around uh, and kind of stuff it all in there and it is secured by a lock and key here. Uh, now, if we kind of lift this out of the way, what that's going to do is go ahead and expose your low point drains. These are going to be the lowest point in the unit's plumbing. This is how we're gonna go ahead and drain everything in between water source and fixture. So again, as a reminder, anytime the unit is gonna be in storage for more than seven days, it is very important that we do go ahead and drain all of the water from the unit. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start at the freshwater holding tank if it's been in use. Uh, we're gonna make sure we drain that completely. We're then gonna come down here to the low point drains. We're gonna open up those. We're gonna drain that to and from plumbing. Last, we're gonna finish up with the water heater uh, using that procedure that we outlined previously. Now, once we've done all of that, we are ready for storage. And uh, if we are doing a full winterization process, uh, what we just talked about is gonna be step number one. Uh, from there, we're going to go ahead and introduce the antifreeze into the system uh, to go ahead and protect not only those appliances, but those water lines during freezing temperatures. Now also here on the underside, we are going to find our bayonet fitting and dump valves. Uh, they are color coded gray for gray water, black for black water. Gray water is gonna be anything that comes from the sink or the shower, and black water is going to be your toilet waste or body waste. Right here in the center, we have our bayonet style fitting and we are going to connect our sewage hose the very same way this cap comes off. So uh, if I go ahead and rotate this off, you can go ahead and see that we have four prongs here along the outside. Uh, on this particular model, we have four keyholes on the uh, cap. On the sewage hose, we have two keyholes. Either way, we will put the cap or the sewage hose in the halfway position, rotate that clockwise until these uh, studs are fully engaged. Now a popular option when it does come to go ahead and dump our wastewater, uh, one thing you do want to uh, remember is that these two valves should never be open at the same time. So that popular option is going to be uh, dumping our black water and once we are satisfied and sure that it is empty, we close that valve. We then open up our gray water that's going to rinse any shared plumbing between the two systems as well as rinse our sewage hose on the way out. Now, one thing in particular, the most important thing to remember uh, is these valves need to be closed or they, during normal operation of the unit, they need to be in a closed position. We have a monitor panel on the in inside of the unit that is gonna indicate the levels to us. Uh, reason being is specifically with this black water holding tank, we wanna keep that toilet paper, that body waste in as wet or flowing condition as we can so that when we do go ahead and relieve the tank, that it does easily evacuate the unit. Here at the rear corner, we're going to find two stabilizer jacks on both the driver and passenger side of the unit. Now these are for stabilizing the unit, they are not for leveling. Uh, the idea being is that this is just gonna make things feel more secure when you're inside walking around. 
uh, so you're not just kind of bouncing off the tires and things like that. So when we go ahead and operate this, we use the included crank handle here. Uh, it is a spline drive system, so we just go ahead and seat that fully. We're gonna go ahead and come down, make contact with the pavement, maybe just a quarter turn more to shore things up. Uh, we don't wanna go ahead and overstress these as they will operate uh, better, longer, if we get in the habit of using a light touch. Same on the way up, you don't really need to hammer down on them, snug is just fine. Here on the passenger side of the unit, first thing we're going to come to is our uh, AC receptacles here on the exterior. Now these are all weather outlets uh, just designed to allow you to further enjoy this space. If you're uh, sitting out here with some lawn chairs, you can go ahead and plug in your boom box, charge some phones, uh, whatever you feel necessary to do. Uh, moving on here, our steps to the unit are very easy to operate. They do just fold in and out. Uh, they do have a little keeper in there that's gonna keep them from prematurely uh, coming out when you're going down the road. We also have kind of a standard door hold back. Uh, the idea being is that we, if we go ahead and open the door, we can just seat this plunger there into the corresponding receptacle and that's gonna keep that door open during use. All right guys, that just about covers it here with the exterior of the 17 FD. Let's hop on the inside and take a look at those appliances and accessories. So first thing we're gonna to come to here on the interior of the 17 FD is going to be our fire extinguisher. Uh, now, I don't need to tell you, this is a very important piece of safety equipment. We wanna make sure that it is in good working order every single time we take the unit out. So uh, not only with our fire extinguisher, but we do need to test all of our safety equipment every single time before we take the unit out. Uh, with the fire extinguisher in particular, there is a test tab on the top. It's this green button. If we go ahead and push that down and we can feel that spring back, uh, that means there's pressure within the unit. It's gonna be in good working order when we need or if we need to use it. Uh, again, we're gonna make sure we do that every single time we take the unit out. Uh, now also right here inside the entry door, we are going to find our porch light switch, uh, just an easy on off toggle switch. We can see that uh, porch light there on the outside. And then turning around here, we're gonna take a look at our dinette. Now this does make a secondary sleeping area. Uh, the idea being with these pedestal style uh, dinettes is that they will separate into uh, three separate pieces. So the tabletop is going to go ahead and be removed from the support poles. Then those support poles are gonna come out of these floor flanges. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and ditch the support poles at this time. We're gonna take our tabletop and we will rest that right here on these rails. We're then going to take our rear cushions and place those on top of the tabletop, going ahead and filling out that space so somebody could, again, potentially sleep there. So all of the overhead lights within this particular camper are going to be push button style. So you'll have a, a little silicone button in the center. We're just gonna push that to turn them on. There's no main overhead light switch to uh, activate all of those at the same time. So they will be turned on and off individually. Uh, now coming here into the kitchen area, of course we have our high point turntable style microwave. I'm not gonna spend too terribly much time on this. Uh, from a functionality standpoint, uh, it is exactly what you would expect. Uh, here on the inside, we do see our turntable. Uh, possibly not a bad idea to secure this when going down the road. I've heard of these maybe vibrate and loose, things like that. Uh, whatever you need to do to make yourself feel comfortable. Uh, and then here into the kitchen area, we are going to find our convenience center or courtesy panel. It does go by a few different names. Uh, this is not only going to give us a real-time readout of where our tanks and batteries sit and level of full, but we're also going to turn our water pump and water heaters on, or water heater on at this location. So uh, if we take a look here at the convenience center portion of this, uh, we can see that as I go ahead and push these buttons for the corresponding tanks, uh, these lights up top light up. There is a scale outlined. Uh, the more lights you see, the more fuller the particular source we are evaluating is going to be. Uh, to get a true or accurate readout of our battery, we do need to unplug from shore power. Uh, if we are plugged into shore power, that battery is always going to read full. Uh, and then down below that, we have our water pump switch. These will uh, be lighted switches, so they'll come on uh, to, they'll indicate with the light that they are on, excuse me. Uh, again, just a reminder that water pump is going to be off for off-grid or boondocking. Can't boondocking. Uh, what that's going to do is pressurize that freshwater system, draw that water up to the fixture and make it usable. 
And then we have our two water heater sources, one being propane gas, again, kind of geared towards the off-grid uh, scenario. And then we have a 110 volt heating element that is going to be utilized in the capacity of an RV park. Uh, now, if you do want the most uh, availability to hot water or the quickest recharge rate, feel free to go ahead and use both sources. That's going to uh, clock in at about 17 gallons per hour. Next up in terms of efficiency is going to be propane gas. Uh, that's generally about 14 gallons per hour. Last but not least is going to be electricity. That's going to come in at about 11 gallons per hour. So uh, feel free to use both of those or uh, use them as those sources present themselves. And then right beside that, we have our main GFCI outlet. All the receptacles throughout this unit are going to be on the same circuit. If one of them were to get overloaded, they all kind of follow suit. Uh, this is gonna be the reset point, just like in many bathrooms uh, in the residential sector. Uh, you will have a test and a reset button. So if you find yourself without power to your receptacles, uh, it's a good idea to go ahead and check this main outlet and make sure it's not tripped. Uh, also here in the kitchen, just a standard kind of small hand washing sink. Um, you know, not gonna spend too much time with that, access to hot and cold. And then we also have a pretty straightforward um, cooktop as well. This is kind of your basic Coleman style cooktop with a dual burner. Uh, we do not have a, a sparker or igniter on this particular model, so we're gonna need to utilize a long stem barbecue lighter to go ahead and light that up. We will turn it here to the lighting indicator uh, and hold our flame directly onto the burner. Once we go ahead and see that burner light up, we can go ahead and choose the intensity of our flame here. Uh, now dropping down here into the kitchen area, I do just wanna go ahead and uh, let you know that this is going to be your furnace uh, blower motor. Uh, all of your heat throughout this unit is going to come from this location with a unit of this size. Uh, it's pretty much oversized, uh, so what that means is you're going to have no problems controlling the temperature within this unit, whether that be with the furnace or the air conditioner. So above my head here, we are going to take a look at our high-powered exhaust fan. Uh, of course, during transit, this needs to be in the closed position. That's going to be a mistake that you only make once. Uh, reason being is it's probably not going to be there when you get to where you're going, so first thing up is we uh, go ahead and rotate this clockwise to open up that cover. Once we do so, we do have some fan speeds here, uh, high, medium, and low. And then we also have a bus style fuse holder there. So if this does have any uh, problems operating, uh, if it's not working for you, first thing I would do is go ahead and check my fuse holder, make sure I didn't blow a fuse. And then we're gonna pop over here to our AC unit. Uh, this is of course a window AC, technically not installed in a window, uh, but it will operate as most do. You have a high fan, a low fan, a low cool, and a high cool, a thermostat up top to choose the intensity of that. And it's a pretty basic unit. Now you do have a filter that will need to be cleaned periodically. That's going to go ahead and slide out the side here. It does have a little finger tap to allow you to do so. So coming around here to the side, we are going to see two things. One is going to be our resettable plug for our air conditioner. So again, if we have any issues with that air conditioner running, my first thing to check would be to make sure that this plug doesn't need to be reset. And then we have our thermostat for our furnace. Uh, so we have a tab here. If I go ahead and turn that into the on position, that's going to go ahead and kick our blower motor on. Uh, the resting position is going to be all the way to the left here for our thermostat. And then as just, you know, as you can see here, we can choose the intensity of that heat. We do have a little thermometer here that's going to indicate the real time temperature throughout the unit. Uh, it may take a little bit of practice to kind of figure out where you like this. Uh, and then when we go ahead and power down the unit, we're going to move this all the way to the left. We're going to take our on off switch, move that to the right. Uh, it will go through a two minute cool down cycle. Uh, now when you are firing this off, that blow motor does come on immediately, 16 seconds after that it actually ignites. By that 30 second mark it's producing noticeable heat. Now in a unit of this size, uh, I would not be surprised if it went ahead and set off the smoke alarm. Uh, it's unavoidable pretty much in these scenarios, especially again with a unit of this size. Uh, every time we light up this furnace, because this unit is in motion most of the time, uh, it's going to be lighting like lighting the furnace in your house the first time every single time so it's going to burn off those impurities that dust and the dirt and that oftentimes will set off your smoke alarm 
Uh, should go ahead and cease after the first 15 minutes of operation. Uh, so not anything that you have to be worried about. Here we have our Jensen stereo unit. This is going to give us uh, access to AM, FM radio and Bluetooth. Uh, also have a couple auxiliary inlets, whether that's going to be USB or HDMI. We have those input ports here. Uh, a pretty basic unit. Uh, functionality is, is pretty easy. I find that most people do not have any issues kind of getting hooked up to this via Bluetooth or listening to the radio. Uh, but if you do, feel free to go ahead and either give us a call or consult the owner's manual that will be included with the unit. And then below that we have our EverChill uh, refrigerator. Uh, this is going to be a 12 volt compressor style refrigerator. This is essentially the future of the industry. Uh, gone mostly are the days of those three-way RV style ammonia absorption refrigerators. This is going to uh, function at a higher efficiency level uh, and really give us a ton more access than you're generally going to find with those ammonia absorption systems. Uh, really our on off button and temperature control is going to be a shared switch uh, on this button. So all we have to do is choose our temperature level. Uh, we do have a small ice box in here as well. Uh, but other than that, it is a super easy to use, pretty straightforward unit. Here we have our shower. Uh, this is going to use a pretty cool, like kind of retractable shower curtain. So it is actually soft uh, and it, it's held in uh, by tension. So if we kind of push in on the handle that releases it and you can see it's kind of self retracting. So it's spring loaded. So you do want to go ahead and keep a hand on it uh, to keep it from shooting back this way. Uh, and then on the inside here, again, not too terribly much we need to speak of. You do have a hot and cold shower, uh, which is going to be that RV style with the all and off uh, flow to go ahead and allow you to conserve that water. And then we do have a pedal style flush here on the floor. That will be a light press to fill the bowl with water, a full press to flush. Uh, any de uh, sanitizing or deodorizing products are going to be introduced from this location directly uh, through the toilet. Uh, just a reminder, we want to make sure that we do use a RV grade single ply toilet paper. Uh, and if our specific camping situation allows us to do so, we want to take a long, uh, as long of flushes as we can, because again, our goal with that black water system uh, is to keep that tank as wet and flowing as we can. First thing we are going to find here underneath the mattress is going to be our carbon monoxide and LP leak detector. Uh, this is a very important piece of safety equipment and as with all of our safety equipment we do test that every single time we take the unit out. Uh, now this unit has one button on it that is going to be our test button. Uh, we go ahead and press that button and it lets you know that it is working properly with a series of light flashes and audible tones. Uh, this is wired into the 12 volt section of the camper so there's no battery to maintain or anything like that. Uh, if our batteries on the coach do get too low this will start indicate, uh, indicating to you that that is actually happening. Uh, and then if we come over here, this is going to be our fuse panel box, uh, fuse panel breaker box and converter. Now here on the left side, we have our resettable light switch style 110 volt breakers, just like you're going to find uh, at home. And then on the right side, we have our replaceable automotive blade style fuses. Now it's going to be my recommendation that you do keep a few spares in these values with the unit. Uh, that way, if you're out there in the wild and you have one that uh, gives up on you, you do have one to replace it. Uh, this is going to give you a little LED indicator uh, to which fuse that you have problems with. And this uh, little window here, you'll be able to see that light through that window so you know just what fuse you need to change. So here on the bed, we are going to find our designated TV area of the camper. Of course, this unit does not come standard with a television. Uh, but if we were to add one later, we could do so. So we have a couple 110 volt outlets. We have our antenna booster. So what this means is you're going to find a omnidirectional digital over the air television antenna on the roof. Uh, and this is going to get its power from this little button. So if we see this green light on and we have this connected to our television, we will then use our TV settings to do a channel search and bring in uh, programming dependent on our location and we also have a couple USB chargers here to go ahead and maintain any USB driven devices that you may find yourself uh, utilizing while camping.
Also here in the bed area, we will find our emergency exit. So uh, if we find ourselves unfortunately in a scenario where our entry door may be blocked by a true emergency, uh, we can exit the unit from this location. So what we would do is we would pull this screen out of the way. Uh, this window or this handle is going to lift out of that plastic keeper uh, and it will actually swing fully open kind of like a doggy door to again allow you uh, to exit the unit from that location. Uh, now if you want to use it as a standard window to allow ventilation throughout the unit, uh, you can still do so. Uh, it does just have a single position. We can see it extended into that position now uh, where this little red handle is again uh, secured by this keeper. Uh, we then go ahead and uh, close it and replace that handle back into that plastic keeper. All right, guys, that just about covers the walkthrough of the 17FD. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it. Hopefully you learned something. If you do have any questions or concerns, feel free to comment below or give us a call. Thank you so much for your time. We hope you have a great day. Say bye. Bye.